Hi guys, and welcome to the review for the Fairtech Mini 3D 3-axis gimbal, as you can see in front of you here. Now, for those of you who haven't actually watched the unboxing video, um, I'd highly recommend it. I go into quite a bit of detail about what you get in the box, um, some of the things from the other gimbals, look at a quick comparison between this and uh, the older ones. Um, I'm going to be going over a lot of this stuff again um, in a bit of detail, but it's well worthwhile just backtracking, just in case I miss anything out that I uh, did actually show in that particular video. So the format that this video is going to take place, um, I'm going to talk about various things. Um, we're going to talk, talk about the pricing, we're going to talk about the weight, I'm going to talk about the fitment, um, the wiring, um, I'm going to look at the modes and demonstrate some of those modes to it. Naturally we're going to have some flight footage so you can see how this thing actually performs in the air. Um, and then I'm going to talk about the goods, the bads and run to conclusions based on you know looking at other gimbals in the market and where this sits in regards to pricing point, ease of use and stuff like that so that's going to be the uh, the format so we'll move on into the pricing for the first point and we will lead on from there Okay, so let's just take a quick look at the pricing. I did mention it in the unboxing video, but I will run through it again very quickly. Um, the price point for this, the 3-axis Mini 3D, that's going to be $179, which equates to about £117. The 2-axis version, which they are doing, um, that is $119, and that equates to about £77. Now, in the UK, obviously, they're going to be slightly higher than those prices because you've got importation tax. I would imagine retailers are going to be selling them for about £150 for the 3-axis version and maybe a hundred pounds for the two axis maybe a little bit more depending on the uh, the place that you're buying it from now when you actually compare those prices to something like the DJI Zen Moose for example uh, the H33D that's still re retailing for about 350 to 400 dollars which equates to about a fairly fixed 250 pounds so very competitive in price if you're comparing it to something like the Zen Moose. Obviously, there's cheaper options out there. You can go the eBay route and get one for 50 quid, um, you know, for, for next to nothing. However, from that point of view, you've got to expect to actually do quite a bit of programming. The weight's going to be a little bit heavier. Um, you're going to have to fiddle about with control boards. Now, a lot of people love doing that, and there's no denying that can be a lot of fun, and you can get really, really good results, better than some manufacturers can actually do out of the box. However, I would say from a price point, this gimbal is going to be really the appeal of it. It's going to be to the people who like plug and play. You know, you plug it into a power source, and it just works. If you want tilt operation, you plug it into a receiver channel. You can it down. There's a lot more functionality in this gimbal that can be done and there's features that could be unlocked if you actually swapped out the control board for um, for another one which I've seen being done on other um, versions of the Fairtech gimbals but for most people this is just going to be an out of the box solution that they want to mount onto their Phantom, onto their F450, uh, their TBS, any anything like that, any frame they're going to want to throw it on there on the understanding that it's going to work and from that point of view I would say the pricing is very competitive. So let's just take a quick look at the weight. I'm going to be using the Hero 4 with a battery inside it. So the Mini 3D 3-axis gimbal with wire and harness is 233. So the G3 Ultra with mount, not attached but still together. And that comes in at a rather portly 313 grams. and now the DJI H3 3D and that comes in at 238 however with the DJI what we want to make sure we don't penalize um, the, the Fairtech products for is that the DJI does need the GCU unit if you're flying it on anything other than a Phantom um, there's also probably a 5 gram bracket that's missing from this uh, mount here as well but to be fair it was also missing from the uh, the Fairtech one when I did that so I would say you know you're talking probably 265 grams and there's quite a bit of associated weight with um, the cables that come the CAN bus cables they're quite chunky so I mean 265 270 grams I would say would be a fair assumption for the uh, the H3 3D in terms of fitment it's uh, very easy to fit this gimbal it comes with the uh, the board which I will show you on a photograph here 
and as you can see this is it actually mounted to the uh, the Phantom that is in front of you right now again now um, so basically fitment just comes with a very simple GRP board there's no PDB there's no um, there's no power distribution board in this upper bracket here it's all just glass fiber basically uh, GRP with various mounting holes for the screws now they are direct fitment to the Phantom 2 this is actually a Phantom 2 frame that you've got in front of you here as well which I've mounted it to no particular problems with that the only problem if you have got a very flat body is that the um, the rubber dampeners at the top here do get squished down slightly uh, most frames they will have holes for those dampeners available but and it's not the end of the world if you have to squash it down there but um, but yeah generally speaking there's enough holes on that that mounting board that you'd be able to work a way of fitting it to any any aircraft pretty much um, and I will discuss fitment on other options other than multi rotors as well in a later part of this video because that is something that uh, this particular gimbal is capable of doing and it's well worth mentioning so general fitment in terms of that is no problem um, when we look at it on the actual Phantom the one thing that you will probably have already noticed is that it's sitting quite low to the ground now bearing in mind this is the original Phantom 2 um, shell so it's what was actually one before the large cutout for the H33D now you can see down here I've actually got these uh, polystyrene these are actually just a bits of off-cut EPO that I've hot glued on to the bottom now of course course there are better options in terms of fitment for a Phantom nowadays you can get the longer gear uh, the, the longer landing legs that came with the H3 3D modification for older Phantom 2 shells you've also got the long tall landing gear which they're now using on the Phantom 3 the only problem and the only reason that I haven't done that is number one for speed and number two from the point of view that I still have a Peli style case and anything that's taller or larger won't fit in it so I wanted something that I could carry about and just adding these simple bits of foam at the bottom you know something like that makes it work the only problem is you can't tilt it when you're actually on the ground you have to wait until you get into the air so a little bit more height there now in terms of the actual um, height of that I, I think that is a bit of a shame that Fairtech didn't think about that they're obviously kind of looking at the later versions of um, things like the uh, the Phantom 2 once again they found themselves at a bit of a crux because the Phantom 3's come out and that's pretty much done away with all gimbals um, because of the, uh, the, the the camera that's already mounted on it so this really is going to be concentrated on the, the older market, the Phantom 2 market and people who have got non-Phantoms the, the other frames, you know, the DIY frames, things like that so it's it's perfectly fine, there's ways around it but it's just something that I, I, I'm a little bit frustrated that it wasn't considered just to raise it up a little bit, give a little bit more room if you squash that up and likewise if you actually look if I spin it round there is plenty of space even if I tilt it backwards there's a gap here which could have been utilized by shortening this arm slightly um, and that would have actually brought the height up again but um, it, it very, very minor point that I think and, and most people for the most part will manage to uh, to cope without that So let's just take a quick look at the wiring with the gimbal off the uh, aircraft at the moment. So very simple wiring, you've got one wiring harness as you can see here, it just plugs in via a multi-connector onto the power distribution board. Um, and from it you have a power connector, this is 3S or 4S capable. The one that came in the box with me actually had a male plug rather than a socket but all of my stuff uses a plug at the battery end or the aircraft end um, and I need a socket for that so I've just crimped a, another one on there I think personal preference really I don't know whether there's an industry standard but either way it's a simple fix if you want to change that other than that you've got standard JR connections uh, just standard servo wires you've got brown and black that does your mode so that goes into a output on your receiver and a three pole switch will flick it between the three modes of operation you've then got a twin wire here one with blue one with white blue is tilt for your gimbal and white is pan which is used in the heading lock mode which I'll demonstrate later on in this video so that is the basic wiring um, that you need to do so obviously if you want to have all of the operations for your um, your pan your tilt and uh, your mode you're going to need three spare servo channels so that can be a little bit of a pain especially if you're using a NASA which uses I think six already um, then you're only going to have space for potentially your tilt and your mode 
switch unless you can work a clever way out of doing it. Anyway, the only other one that needs to be mentioned is this one, and this is a really nice change. This is something that's new from these gimbals, which is a video output cable. So the way that that actually works is you've got on the back of it, if I just zoom in slightly, there we go, you can see there is a little Molex connector that runs to a USB port here, so all we need to do is plug that into the USB port of your GoPro and basically that is then taking the video signal via this cable which does come in the box to this port and then it sends it up the gimbal and to the, uh, the black and the yellow wire right there. Now the only thing that I would mention, it's a little bit hazy and I'm still waiting for an answer from Fairtech. The manual shows the layout of this, um, but the problem is, as you can see, there's a missing slot here. Now interestingly on the manual it shows a three, uh, a three pin cable, just like I've got for the video cable, but it also highlights that this top pin does actually supply 5 volts. So I believe what you can do, and it may be a case of you have to do it yourself optionally, you can take a 5 volt feed and then you can actually feed power to your camera from it. Now that would be really nice if it was included, um, obviously on my one it doesn't, it doesn't do any powering whatsoever. And the thing that's a real shame about that is that actually this gimbal, if I show you like this now, if I just zoom out, So with the camera in place like that, as you can see, it's fairly well balanced. Now I don't have the battery in it at the moment. If I actually take it out of the hanger, and I slide open the GoPro, slot the battery in, pop it back in the hanger, okay. What you'll see is the balance with the battery in is pretty poor. Um, there's a lot of weight on one side of, of that camera. Um, it copes fine with it. I've flown with it. All my test footage is, is um, with it being like that. It doesn't scream. It doesn't howl. Um, but it seems to be that it's designed to balance with the battery um, actually out of the, the Hero 4. Obviously, if you've got a Hero 3, you've got to use it with the battery. So it has to be capable of doing that. But just an interesting point from that point of view. And obviously, stay tuned with uh, this video or, um, or my blog. And I'll update if there is any updates on uh, whether or not that should have the power cable included with it or whether that's just an addition that you have to manually add afterwards. Okay, so as you can see, there's a bit of wiring going on here, and I've jacked the Phantom up on a couple of batteries just to uh, give it a little bit of ground clearance so I can play around with some modes. So what I'll do is I'll demonstrate what the modes look like, um, talk about each one, I'll show you a little problem that I'm experiencing with one of the modes, which hopefully will be sorted out via a firmware update, um, but it's quite a useful thing to do because I've, I've done this in the air, and you will see a demonstration of these modes whilst in the air, but seeing it on the ground is quite useful as well to, to know exactly how each one actually works. So let's power on the gimbal and as you can see as soon as we start the uh, the power up basically what you've got is you've got a standard um, three axis gimbal mode which is the heading follow mode as per Fairtex manual. Now what that means is that if I pick up the Phantom and I yaw around you'll see there's a nice catch up follow on and a smooth pan so it will follow the aircraft around fairly basic, fairly standard, exactly the same as something like a DJI Zen Moose does uh, where it will lock into the horizon so if I tilt forward you'll see that it will stay on horizon and back and it will stay on horizon. Now one of the problems with this uh, current firmware that I seem to be experiencing is that if I do the uh, the tilt, so that is to say if I can bring this into shot, so I'm using a slider switch on the back of my Futaba, if I tilt it down you'll notice that not only does it tilt up, I mean that's just the fact that I need to reverse my channel, but it also yaws around slightly. So I'm now tilting that fully down and you'll see it very slowly settles, so it's now settled into the correct horizon position, but if I fast tilt forwards it will tilt around and then again it will just settle. If I go to the middle, tilt around 
and it will then settle. So there's obviously a firmware issue there, um, something needs to be changed. Um, I have to admit this is the more recent firmware so I'm going to report this back to Fairtech. It may be that the original firmware didn't have this problem and it's not a major issue but as you can see if you were doing a lot of panning and til uh, uh, of tilting it's actually doing a pan around. Um, which is very strange, not entirely sure why it does it, but actually when you actually do just a nice slow tilt it's got a quite a steady tilt on it and in the air it certainly seems to be responding quite well to it so um, yeah a little bit of a strange one there but that's the uh, that's the mode one so the next mode which if I flick my switch is the heading and pitch follow mode so I'm going to flip my three pole switch and we're now in heading and mode follow. Now you can see the camera just tilted down slightly when I flip the switch. The reason for that is that if I try and do a tilt now, which I'm doing as you can hear from the beeping, nothing's happening. The reason for that is that we're now in a very similar mode. So if I grab it and I pan around, once again it will follow it. However, if I pan forwards, the camera will follow to a certain point and then it will glitch. And if I tilt backwards, likewise the camera will go up. Now it's doing the same thing as it was with the tilt in the sense of it does give a slight yaw. So again there's a maybe a firmware issue that needs to be looked at from uh, Fairtech's point of view. Um, but basically yeah, the idea is that certainly on a multi-rotor you're probably not going to use this because as you're moving forward it's going to be pointing downwards, as you move back it's going to be pointing upwards. Um, on a fixed wing aircraft it could be quite useful because if you've got this mounted to a fixed wing aircraft it means that if you did a steep dive like this it would actually look at the ground and then if you come upwards it will tilt up and it will do a nice smooth sort of uh, tilt up into the air. So a, a useful mode potentially for fixed wing, less interesting for multi rotors. And again, it's something that you don't want. You, you don't want this this yaw that's happening at certain points where it just doesn't quite stay straight on and it takes a moment to settle. So a bit of a strange one there. But anyway, that's uh, that's the mode number two. And then the final mode is what is known as heading lock mode. So if I go heading lock you'll see the camera tilts up. Now basically what this does is this will focus on a fixed point in space. So right now we're, fo we're focusing the camera so whatever I do that camera should now continue to look at the other camera. So no matter what I do it will stay fixed and from my experience as you'll see in the footage that is a very very good mode that locks very very well and in fact I was finding that if I really wanted to get a nice smooth shot from the air that actually I would leave it in heading lock mode pointing at the object I was looking at and then it would stay more fixed than it would if it was actually in any of the other two modes so uh, an interesting point there now what's really nice about this and this is kind of the, um, the, the thing that I love about this particular mode is if I now use my other slider switch which is hooked into another servo output what I can do is I can move the camera left and right and of course I can also pan up and down using the other one so I have good control but what's really great about this is look at the range that it's got it will do 120 degrees of motion so basically that's all the way around that way facing the back of the camera and if I keep it spinning all the way round and you can see that it is almost there so I mean that that is much more range than the G3 had um, there's no locking barrier apart from right at the back there so I mean you really do have almost a full 180 so if you could get this onto an aircraft obviously it doesn't have landing legs like the Phantom um, then you're going to be able to you know use this in in you know much better much better way like uh, something like the Inspire um, you know you can't do a full rotation um, but you can do almost all the way around and the smoothness of the tilt isn't too bad I think a bit of expo on it I mean these slider switches that I've got aren't perfect I've removed the ratchet system on them but ultimately it's pretty good and, and it is one of the most impressive parts of this gimbal I would say is the heading lock mode because actually and you can see the pan and the tilt in heading lock mode doesn't have the same problem 
that you do in the other two modes. So if I flip back into the main heading follow mode, you can see there's that movement. If I tilt back and forward, there's that left and right. Again, I'm fairly sure it's a firmware problem and no doubt it will be solved by Fairtech by the time I've put this video out, um, if not beforehand. Um, and if not, they'll certainly have to work on it. But anyway, that's the, uh, the demonstration of the various modes on the ground. So let's take a look at a little bit of footage. This is the uh, maiden flight underneath the Phantom 1.5 that I have, which is basically a Phantom 2 shell. The reason that I've gone with this is because I've got the DJI battery in it, which means it's acting like a Phantom 2. It's got a really nice center of gravity. I did do some, some testing with the Immersion RC Zoo Gong, but because there is a little bit of jitter on that frame sometimes, I felt this was a more true test for just a stock setup. Now one thing that I'm going to look for, as you can see by these red lines, is I'm going to be looking for roll drift and horizon lock. One of the key things that makes a good gimbal a good gimbal is the fact that it can hold the horizon. Now because I'm using a phantom I've tilted down which means we've got a slight curvature of the earth. But the key thing to be looking for as you go through these videos is just take note on how level that horizon stays. If I yaw around especially whether or not that uh, the, the horizon on the left comes down a little bit too far and the right goes up because that is a sure sign of horizon drift and that's basically something that we want to avoid. The more locked in it feels and one of the reasons that the Zen Moose is such a good gimbal is because that horizon stays very firm. Now the other thing that you're going to notice as you're watching this is that there is quite a bit of wobble. This is a real bone of contention for me. Unfortunately, for a $179 gimbal, Fairtech have gone back to using their 10 cent soft rubber anti-vibration dampening spheres they're useless they really are too soft and unfortunately because the mounting frame now hangs underneath the fixing point it means they're not under compression that means that soft rubber like this is very very susceptible to movement so in other words if you move your aircraft around if you've got a twitchy aircraft which to be fair the phantom is quite twitchy um, what it means is it translates to a, a, a wobble, a vibration. Um, and unfortunately, the really annoying thing is that Fairtech actually listened to people complaining about this on the G3, the two-axis version, and on the G3 Ultra, they upped their game and they increased the rigidity of the rubber on the G3 gimbal, and they also put it under compression, which worked quite well. It meant that the G3 Ultra didn't really suffer from this. However, unfortunately, on this Mini, this is a real problem. There are ways around it. Um, number one, you can source other anti-vibration spheres, but Fairtech use a particularly small one. They fit in what I believe to be a 6mm hole rather than an 8mm hole. So you can't use DJI ones, you can't use Immersion RC ones, which is a real shame, and it's something that I wish they would do something about. However, this is a mini gimbal, so you don't want bigger stuff on it, which is understandable. What I've tried in a video that will follow this video is I've actually added some earplugs. So what I've done is I've taken some compressible foam earplugs, I've chopped them in half to make them a bit smaller, and then I've literally rammed them inside the anti-vibration spheres. It's a, a little trick that someone came up with for the uh, the Zugon V2 Pro for a similar problem that was uh, was having some wobble. Um, and what it does is it basically the, the foam then decompresses inside the sphere and it puts some tension on that rubber and it basically creates a much harder feeling now it's a definite improvement as you'll see however it's still not perfect so um, for anyone who knows the source of uh, the smaller style Fairtech sized anti-vibration spheres it's something that you're going to want to try and look for um, I'm going to do some digging see if I can find a source of the G3 Ultra ones and likewise what I'm going to do is I'm going to put my G3 Ultra ones on this frame um, and I'll see whether or not that is a significant improvement it should be noticed as you watch this that you can see from the top of the trees there really isn't a lot of wind so it's not wind doing this and the frame itself the phantom is very good from cg so it's not an instability it is a little bit twitchy however and that's another point that i'm going to talk about in a moment in regards to um the size of the frame and the way that the gimbal responds underneath it based on where the gimbal is mounted on the frame um, and the aircraft itself however as you can see behind the wobble when you get to a slower speed, this gimbal really is actually pretty good. Um, you know, for a price point, it's quite impressive, which is why it's even more frustrating that a cheap part sort of sullies the name of it. But we'll look at some more footage now, and uh, hopefully we can see a little bit more from what the gimbal can do. 
So this is now the short clip of using the earplug method to give a bit more kind of rigidity to the anti-vibration spheres. Uh, same flying place, same location, same outflight, which is why I wanted to use it. No point in putting it side by side with the other one because I do different things. However, it should just give you an indication of how a little bit firmer dampeners can improve this. And most importantly, I think, you know, I can be very negative about this, but... I think there is a good gimbal lurking behind these and as you can see from these shots this is a perfectly usable shot. It's not perfect, it could be improved and to be honest worst case scenario you could remove the dampeners altogether and you could hard mount this to a frame and I think as long as you've got good balance props and good balance motors I don't think you're going to have a jello issue. I think you're going to be able to get some good functionality out of this gimbal um, and I really do think this is an improvement, a massive improvement on the, the 2 axis and the G3 ultra out of the box um, and uh, you know and I, I think this is something that is going to be a usable product for people however unfortunately it's just those rubber spheres that are really doing it no favors but um, as always people will buy this product whether they see my review or not they will buy it they will tweak it they will find ways around it as I will um, and again I think it's important to look past some of the cheaper replaceable parts to look at the gimbal itself and as you can see as I just pan around here it's nice and smooth it's a good quality shot. It's perfectly usable, um, you know. And, and as always, people have standards. I'm used to using an H3 3D, which is just so dialed in, so locked in that I'm just used to almost perfection. Um, for me, you know, I would be able to use this shot, but I would always want to have something that's a little bit more dialed in. However, I think there is um, there is a lot of potential with this gimbal so far. And what I'll do after this part of video, so you've seen a kind of a, a comparison of the two, what I'll do is I'll show you some of the other features. I'll show you the modes in use in flight, so especially the headlock mode, because I think that's very impressive when you're actually in flight in what you can do with it. Um, and then what I'll do is I'll come back, we'll talk about some of the good points, the bad points, what I like, what I don't like um, and you know some of the improvements that will hopefully come down the line and uh, and we'll run some conclusions from that and end the review so this is a demonstration of the heading lock mode whilst I'm actually in flight now this is actually with it attached to my Emergen RC Zuvon V2 Pro uh, a little bit before I took it for a demo flight with the Phantom um, basically there were really high winds um, which is why this is uh, not an ideal demonstration but what I'm doing right now is I'm literally panning the camera around so I've got it in heading lock mode and I'm panning the camera using my slider switch on my Futaba so as you can see I have the ability of looking at the underbelly of my modified Zubon V2 Pro you can see there my retractable VTX antenna which isn't down at the moment because I need the servo port to be able to activate the gimbal but you can see what a windy day it is you can see the compensation and you can see how this gimbal is actually coping quite well with it considering we're talking 17 to 20 mile an hour gusts at the moment now what I'm doing, I'm not moving the camera, I'm actually yawing the aircraft. So this is the testament to how good this gimbal is coping in heading lock mode, is that in this high wind I am literally sending the, cam the, the aircraft around the gimbal. So all I am doing right now is I'm holding a yaw input, that's all I am doing and I was just doing a nice slow steady yaw. I've got my Zugong set up so I can do a kind of a, a nice slow yaw via an expo setting so it's nice and soft but you can see that this gimbal does hold its fix on that location really nicely. There's no jitter, there's no movement, there's a bit of vibration from the dampers and now I've hit that barrier. So that's just an example and if I flick it out of the mode as I do now and then I can continue my flight. But a very nice mode I would say. So finally we just really need to have a look at the various orientation modes that you can also use for this gimbal. Obviously you've seen this one which is hanging down from an aircraft. However you do also have the option of doing it this way around. Um, so you've got it actually sat on top of something. Now as you can see the camera would be upside down. Not a major problem for a Hero 4 with automatic orientation flipping. But if you wanted to have it the other way you don't have to unscrew anything from the gimbal. don't have to rotate the motors like you did on the old ones. All you have to do unscrew your camera pull it out, flip your arm over, put your camera back in, thus making sure all the ports are present on this side, screw it up and turn it on. And sure enough you now have all of the same modes so if I put it into heading mode I can now rotate around and basically you have a little pan and tilt 
gimbal. Very nice. So that is that mode. So the final mode that is available to us is what is known as forward installation or vertical mode. Now I'm going to show you a very quick diagram of uh, what's on the instruction manual for this here. And as you can see, basically it would suggest that what you have to do is put your gimbal um, into the upside down mode. So I'm going to do that now. So according to this, that's the orientation. So let's go back to the manual now. And then if we read the wording, you can see that it says that with the inverted installation mode, switch to heading follow mode six times in succession. The gimbal will be switched to vertical installation and stop the motor. Remove the power and install to the correct installation mode, then power back up to work normally. The install impression drawing, please refer to the picture B, so a little bit of Chinese English there and somewhat undecipherable. However, so let's go back to what we've got in front of us. So basically, my understanding would be that we turn it on like this, so I'll do that. And as you can see, it turns upside down because it's not particularly happy with what's going on. Okay, so that is now upside down. So now what we do is we go one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. You have to do seven, it says six, you have to do seven, otherwise the motors don't die. And that's now killed the motors off. It's all plugged in still. So now I'm going to unplug the battery. I'm going to turn it around. So we want this mode, so it's going to be this way round. That's the orientation we're looking for. And then with one hand, I'm going to plug it in. And it should recognize it. And you can see the problem. And this is the problem that I've been having, basically. If I put that back down into normal mode, the camera faces backwards. Um, and unfortunately, no matter what I do with the pitch, I can't get it doing that. Now, the other thing that might not be obvious, um, and maybe if I pan it around, you can see there's an angle as well. So the board is straight, but the gimbal is actually pointing at like a 45 degree angle. So something is clearly not right. Now, at one point I thought, well, that's all right. It must be just in normal mode. And if I pan it like this, that's now vibrating and doing horrible things. So it's clearly not in that mode. It's clearly in this other mode, but it's just not doing what it should do. Um, so a little bit confused on that one. Um, if I want to take it back out of this mode again, one, two, three four, five, six, seven, and it dies. So it does that part, obviously after seven rather than six. And then if I take it back into this mode and now just pick it up normally, and there you go, we've initialized as should be. And all of the various modes, so my pitch. I flip that, see that should work as it does. And we're back into normal mode. So um, unfortunately, I'm not able to really demonstrate that working. Um, I have posted an email with all of these various points that I've put in the review. Um, I don't think it's something you want to get put off by too much. Um, it's obviously meant to work. It may be that I'm doing something stupid. It may be that the manual isn't clear enough and I'm doing something wrong where I need to reverse something or change something over. Um, I'll get some feedback. So please keep an eye on the um, on the comments. And obviously, if it's worthy of a um, a follow-up video I will do that but that's just kind of an overview of what it's doing at the moment just in case other people have got it out of the box and are having similar problems so with a bit of footage from the Phantom continuing in the background let's just draw some conclusions talk about the pros and the cons the goods and the bads and get a kind of a final idea of what I feel on this gimbal um, I've highlighted quite a lot of kind of niggles with this gimbal, um, more so than I would say I have actually highlighted on any of the Fairtech products beforehand. Some of them are very frustrating. The rubber dampeners, I keep going on about them, but they are the, the, the major flaw on this so far. Um, the good news is that they're a simple fix. Um, it's not going to take much to find a better solution to it, whether that be a case of finding some firmer ones, firming up the ones you have, or whether it's a case of just doing some hard mounting on it. So that is at least a good thing. I've also highlighted a few of the little glitches that I think is easily going to be sorted out via some firmware. Frustrating that it isn't done out of the box, frustrating that it has 
hasn't been better tested definitely but then again at this price point and from Fairtex point of view I've yet to actually have one that is absolutely perfect from that point of view. The good thing I think that needs to be pointed out here is that behind the scenes of all of these little niggles I do think there is a good product. Um, it's one of those gimbals, it's well built, it's well constructed, it's lightweight the outputs are very good, I like the modes, I especially like the heading lock mode and the fact that you've got this really nice 120 degree pan round. That in itself is something that I think is a, is a major selling point for this because that, that exceeds all the ones that I've certainly used. I, I believe that if you spend the money um, on something like a Storm 32 controller you will probably be able to come up with a solution that is better than this. That said, if you've got the, uh, the nous and the know-how to do it you could actually use this frame and upgrade it to Storm 32. I think the key with that is that that's a different market. The, the people who enjoy tinkering and messing around with settings and perfecting gimbals, um, that is a market in its own and I think you can get a very very good result from doing it. This gimbal is very much plug and play, out of the box, does it work? And I think after the firmware updates, the answer to the question for this gimbal is going to be yes. Unfortunately, as it stands right at this moment in time, and before I get answers from Fairtech, I have to admit that I am a little disappointed in the performance, purely for the fact that it's got these little niggles. The main bad points that I've highlighted, obviously I've talked about the rubbers, the other thing is the fact that there is this slight twitch when you're actually holding it in a steady line. So this is in the standard mode. You're holding it and you're just trying to keep the camera at an angle. And basically there's just ever so slightly these little left to right movements. My opinion is that it's compensating because it's sitting in the center of gravity for the Phantom. Um, especially because it's on the Phantom which is right in the middle of that center of gravity. So any little GPS maneuver is causing the IMU to actually respond to it inside the gimbal maybe it's just a case of it's a little bit oversensitive so again hopefully there are some tweaks that Fairtech can do with that I would love to see a better settings program for this gimbal um, the G3 Ultra had some settings you could actually level the horizon so if you had an IMU that was slightly out you could change that I will of course be testing the old version of the, form, um, of the software to see whether you can do that it worked on the G4 and if this has got the same controller inside it then there's every chance that it could work for this particular gimbal as well so that's a couple of things that in the future will hopefully improve also I think on another platform if this was actually rail mounted and it was actually hanging over the front of an aircraft a longer frame for example it would be further away from the center of gravity for that reason those little tiny twitches that you feel may actually be dulled down slightly um, and indeed it would have been nice if, if my Zugong was actually um, able to, to have it mounted in wind that wasn't quite so bad but as you can see from the footage that I'm filming here, I think the important thing to take away is that everyone has their standards. I personally still believe firmly that DJI Zen Moose is pound for pound the better option if you want amazing footage with a hero based system. That said, there are undeniably some compromises that you have to have when using a Zenmoos. You have to have a NASA flight controller, for example. You've got to have the GCU if you're not using a Phantom controller. If you are using a Phantom, you've got the issues with the legs. Um, and also the fact that the price point is a lot higher than something like this. So it's not to say that it's better purely for the fact that it's a better gimbal. It's better because it's a more expensive item and it ties into a flight controller. It learns what you are doing, it knows what you are doing, it's, it knows your inputs basically and on a Fayetech product like any other product it has to actually feel that movement before it can respond. So to get it perfect every time you need a lot of tweaking and I think therein lies the problem with something like a Fairtech problem is that, it is that basically you are dealing with a Hero 4, a Hero 3, a Hero 4 without a battery gimbals are all about balance and a perfect gimbal the best gimbal is one that is almost perfectly balanced with the camera just sat as it is before you even turn it on that means that your motors are only dealing with compensation for movement with Fairtech products like a few others 
they're not dealing with just compensation movements they're physically holding the camera up and that I think has some negative results but again as you can see from the footage that's on screen right at the moment it's really not that bad especially once you've dealt with the anti-vibration spheres other little niggles that I would say are worth considering are if you want to get the best out of this product so all of the various modes what you need to be able to do is you need to have the various servo outputs now if you're flying something like a NASA you're going to be using channels 1, 2, 3, 4 for normal flight you're also going to use 5 for IOC you're going to use 6 for uh, the gimbal tilt or the other way around and you've got a mode switch so you're using 7 channels already that means if you've got an 8 channel receiver you've only really got one spare channel available obviously what you can do if you've got the tilt mode you're going to use one channel for that so you'll be able to plug into that but it means that you're not going to have the full capacity to have the heading lock mode with the pan unless you've got a ninth channel now using easy UHF like I've got with a PPM setup I was able to tap into every single one of them using the servo outputs but again it's one of those little things and as you've just witnessed it takes a hit which is quite good that's smashed into a rather tall piece of grass um, and as you can see it's slowly recompensating and adjusting itself just before I catch it anyway hopefully that is a good overview of the gimbal and I hope you enjoyed watching